Audio of World History, Unit 12, World War II, the Cold War, and eventual globalization. It is August 1939 when we left off from the last unit. Hitler is moving toward invading Poland. Britain and France state that they will fight if he does. Then something really weird happens that shocks them to the core. Hitler has outmaneuvered them again to avoid a two-front war. So August 1939, the USSR shocked the world by signing a non-aggression pact, the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact, or treaty, with Germany. This way, Germany could avoid a two-front war. It's important to remember, however, that this is not an alliance. It is a non-aggression pact. Hitler approached Stalin, even though they hate each other. They're on opposite ends of the political spectrum. And he argued with him that they could split Poland in half, with the Soviet Union having the eastern half and the Nazi having the western half. And they agreed to stay out of each other's way. Now, Hitler never intended on keeping this pact forever. It was just what suited him at the moment so he could avoid a two-front war. He thought that he could then attack Great Britain and France, knock them out before he turned around and violated the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact and invaded the Soviet Union. We all knew that this was what he was going to do because we know that he had outlined this in Mein Kampf, where he said that he needed Lebensraum for the Aryan race, specifically targeting Eastern Europe and all of the grain-rich fields of Eastern Europe. Stalin knew this too, but Stalin was also an opportunist, both of them being totalitarian dictators. They're both opportunists. And Stalin argued that he should just take that the part of Poland that he was um, offering him at this point, then he could get ready for when he knew Hitler would eventually violate the non-aggression pact. So it's important to know that this is not an alliance. It's just an agreement that they will stay out of each other's way. And this was a way that Hitler could avoid a two-front war at the beginning. He hoped he could knock out the um, what Great Britain and France first. Then he could focus on taking over Russia. This, of course, is just a political cartoon about the marriage of the Nazis and the Soviets. Uh, saying, wonder how long the honeymoon will last. Of course, it does not last very long. Now, as we know, starting in 1936, Germany formed the Axis powers, including Italy in 1936, and then inviting Japan into the Axis alliance by 1940. All three of these countries desired aggressive expansion. Um, in Germany and Italy were both fascist. <clears throat> now, 
why did Hitler invite Japan into the alliance? This is important for the future of World War II. Japan throughout the 1930s had been seizing territory, invading Manchuria, taking it from China, taking over other areas in the Pacific Rim, and um, even tangling a little bit with the United States over this issue, not outright fighting, but the United States had issued an oil embargo against Japan in 1935. Germany recognized that Japan um, would be a good ally to have in their corner in case the United States decided to get involved in the war. Remember, the United States had declared itself splendidly isolated once again, especially since the Great Depression was going on. However, we were supplying um, both Great Britain and France like we did before World War I. Now, Hitler knew that the United States, it was highly probable that they would eventually get involved in this war um, because he saw that it happened in World War I. Remember, he fought in World War I. He knew what happened. So he was trying to plan for any um, anomaly that could happen. Um, it's kind of like a game of chess where you have to kind of predict what your opponent might do. And you may have to predict different moves that your opponent might make. And just in case this happens, I'm going to do this. Just in case this happens, I'm going to do this. That was why he invited Japan into the Axis Alliance, just in case the United States got involved in this war. In this case, if he, he thought they would have to fight on two fronts. The United States would have their forces divided between a Pacific War and a European War. Now, September of 1939, this is when the war begins. Germany invades Poland on September 1st of 1939. And two days later, on September 3rd, Great Britain and France declared war on Germany. Now, it's important to remember that Germany had been rearming for war ever since 1935. And for that period of time, from 1935 until right now in 1939, the West, or Great Britain and France, had been trying to appease Hitler. They had not been preparing for war, not greatly preparing for war. So Hitler knows that they are not ready. They know that he knows that they are not ready. And so this is why for the first year and a half or so of the war, Hitler will try to work as quickly as he can to secure as much territory as possible, hoping to maybe knock both Great Britain and France out invading them before they can attack back and do a counterattack. And then he can, of course, violate that non-aggression pact and invade Russia and ultimately control all of Europe. The United States, as I said, was neutral. Although there was a lot of anti-Hitler and anti-Nazi sentiment throughout the United States, and there was a lot of um, desire to help Great Britain and France, wanting them to win, especially when you look at our president, FDR. We agreed that we would sell products to Great Britain and France on a cash and carry basis only, meaning we will send them weapons um, and, uh, and materials and they can pay us later. The um, FDR had, was noted to have said, this nation will remain a neutral nation but I cannot ask that every American remain neutral in thought as well. He knew that there was a lot of anti-Nazi um, sentiment. In the winter of 1939, right after the war was declared, there was a bit of a lull between 19, winter of 1939 and, of course, you know, January, February of 1940. There was a lull in the action because Great Britain and France were quickly trying to mobilize and Germany was trying to determine what to do next. Um, Germany had their panzer tanks ready to go with part of their blitzkrieg tactics, but tanks don't work well in the snow. So this little lull that happened right here at the very beginning of the war made a lot of people refer to this war as the phony war because nothing was happening. And some people started to think, perhaps maybe this war won't actually happen. They were wrong, of course. So in the spring of 1940 is when Hitler's blitzkrieg is put into action. 
and the Nazis will quickly move into Denmark and Denmark falls within a week. Then moving into Norway, Norway falls in a few weeks. Then moving to the Netherlands, falling quickly, and then into Belgium. You can see where Hitler's headed next, to France. Now the blitzkrieg tactics are working very well for him, which we'll discuss in the next slide. Using blitzkrieg tactics, and like I say, I'll explain a little bit more, Germany turned to focus on France. It takes France about a month to be secured, but he enters France in early May, and by June of 1940, France is forced to surrender, and Germany will have occupied France and will remain in France for four years until June of 1944. Now, this is how the blitzkrieg tactics work. And the reason why Hitler developed the Blitzkrieg is because Germany could not afford to get embroiled in a stalemate type of war again like they had in World War I. They lacked the resources, and so Hitler needed to move quickly to force his opponent to back down as quickly as possible. And so this is how it happened. It was a three-pronged attack. <clears throat> Once a strategic target had been selected, planes from the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, were sent in to soften up the enemy, to drop a bunch of bombs on the enemy target, soften them up, destroying all of the rail lines, destroying the communication centers, and all of the major rail links. This was done as the German tanks were approaching to push through any lines that had formed. And the planes withdrew only at the last minute so that the enemy did not have time to recover their senses when the tanks attacked, supported by the infantry. So it goes planes, then tanks, then infantry. Shock and awe, if you will, forcing the opponent to back down very quickly because they just don't know what hit them. And it worked very well for Hitler. And because France had not been able to fully mobilize by that point, uh, France falls within a month, and France will be occupied by the Nazis for four years before being liberated by Great Britain and um, the United States on D-Day, June of 1944. So, France's fall shocked the world. Britain now is the only country left in Europe to oppose Hitler. If you look at this map, you will see the areas controlled by the Nazis. Now, of course, some of them are allied with the Nazis. Italy <clears throat> is allied with the Nazis. We know also that Spain had a fascist dictator, and even though it's not involved directly in the war, um, they were complicit with the Nazis. Um, uh, Franco will allow um, Hitler to use his ports, in order to secure the control of the coastline of France, as well as to move into Northern Africa. Both Italy and Germany are moving into Northern Africa and taking those territories after they take France. Remember, a lot of those Northern, Northwestern African territories were French colonies, so now they belong to the Nazis. Here's Hitler in front of the Eiffel Tower. The Nazi armies marching through Paris. The Arc de Triomphe with the Nazis invading, and of course the devastated French people. Now, Great Britain is alone, and he thinks that he can secure Great Britain and force them to capitulate <clears throat> fairly quickly. But Hitler is not stupid. He may be crazy, but he's not stupid. He knows that an invasion of Britain is going to be difficult because Great Britain is an island country. He also knows that Great Britain has not been successfully invaded since 1066 when William the Conqueror of Normandy did so. So this is going to be a difficult feat. Great Britain still has a, a fairly strong navy, one of the best navies in the world, and Hitler's navy, well, Germany's navy, had been dismantled after World War I. <clears throat> He also recognized, and it was said to have said, I am a um, hero on the land, but a coward on the water. So he knew that an invasion of Great Britain was going to be difficult, especially because he couldn't use his blitzkrieg tactics because you can't get the tanks through the water. He was going to have to send them over uh, through the, an amphibious assault. That was going to be difficult. <clears throat> 
So what he decided to do is just use his air force to try to soften the target first, to try to force Great Britain to capitulate without, so an invasion could be secured. So starting in August of 1940, the Battle of Britain begins, and uh, it began as Hitler launched air attacks on Great Britain. First, he was specifically um, focused on the RAF, or Royal Air Force, installations, hoping that he could knock their planes out <clears throat> so they could not counterattack his planes in the air. Um, unfortunately for Hitler, Great Britain had a new tool that had been given to them by the United States that Hitler didn't have. It was called radar. And so the British planes always seemed to be out of the installations and in the air whenever the bombing runs happened with the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. <clears throat> Ultimately, the Royal Air Force was able to prevent the planned invasion. Great Britain um, will be attacked also in the, in the civilian population. Hitler will attack the cities like London in what's called the Blitz. Um, and many people in London had to evacuate, especially the children being evacuated to the countryside. Um, ultimately, he was hoping to force the government under Winston Churchill, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, to back down to, in order to save its people. But the, <clears throat> but the British people do not back down. And ultimately, Hitler, by December of 1940, has to call off the invasion of Great Britain. He did not have the impact that he had wanted. So now here he is having to make a decision if he's going to go ahead and invade the Soviet Union, breaking that non-aggression pact, before he was able to secure Great Britain which would, of course, mean that he would be fighting a two-front war. But he feels as if he has hurt Great Britain enough. They are isolated. They are the only ones on the West who are fighting against him. So he makes that decision. Now, it is important to also recognize that the U.S. cash and carry that we talked about before, as well as the Lend-Lease program, provided Great Britain with war supplies and kept her in the fight. FDR said that we must become the arsenal of democracy. And so eventually we will send supplies and also um, lease our naval bases to different countries that were fighting against the Axis powers throughout the war. Now the USSR at this point in time, 1940, is not in the war, but they will be as we will see <clears throat> in the next couple of slides. <clears throat> In August of 1941, four months before we officially enter the war, the Atlantic Conference was held where FDR and Brit Britain's Winston Churchill will meet to try to determine what should happen once the war ends. Yes, I know the war has just really begun, but they learned their lessons from World War I where there was only one world leader who had a plan for the post-war world, and that was Woodrow Wilson. They don't want to make that mistake again, so they want to already have in place, even before the war is secured, what should happen once victory happens, hoping that victory happens. So that is what the Atlantic Charter will be, a plan for the post-war Europe. In the Atlantic Charter, the um, FDR and Churchill reaffirmed Wilsonian ideas that were in the original 14 points of Wilson. The notion of self-determination is secured. No territorial changes after the war will happen, and a new international organization to replace the failed League of Nations will be put in place. That will eventually become the United Nations. Here are the eight principal points of the Charter. No territorial gains were to be sought by the United States or by the United Kingdom, meaning no mandates as territories are taken away from um, the Axis powers. Territorial adjustments must be in accord with the wishes of the people concerned. No more arbitrarily drawn borders where you have people on the wrong side of borders like they did after World War I. All peoples had a right to self-determination. Trade barriers were to be lowered. 
There was to be global economic cooperation, cooperation and advancement of social welfare. This will be the beginnings of what we will eventually see become the European Union after the war is over. The participants would work to, uh, for a world free of want and fear. The participants would work for freedom of the seas and there was to be disarmament of the aggressor nations and a post-war common disarmament as well to try to avoid a massive world war again. So, as I said before, after Hitler had to call off the invasion of Great Britain in December of 1940, now he has determined that he's going to go ahead and violate the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact and invade the USSR. He begins this invasion in June of 1941. It's important to realize something. Others have tried to invade Russia before and failed. Napoleon comes to mind, if you will. It's important to also know that there are only about three months of the year where the ground is not frozen in the Soviet Union. So it's very difficult to invade the Soviet Union because you have to move so quickly. You only have so little time. But Hitler thought that he could do it, so he launches this invasion beginning in June of 1941 using Blitzkrieg, pushing in very quickly um, westward, <clears throat> sorry, eastward into the Soviet Union in what it was called Operation Barbarossa. Here is a political cartoon showing that um, Hitler has violated the non aggression pact. Uh, he was going to give uh, Stalin in embrace and instead stabs him in the back, says, forgive me, comrade, but it seems such a good opportunity. Remember, he needs Lebensraum for the Aryan race. He needs the, the uh, agricultural fields of the Soviet Union to feed his growing Aryan race. Unfortunately for Hitler, his assumed victory will eventually fall apart and he will get bogged down and end up in a stalemate type of war, which is exactly what he did not want. The Soviet Red Army received USA through the Lend-Lease program and the bitter winter settled in by the September and that undid any of the initial German successes. Germany will be stuck literally in the snow and the mud, the tanks, and they will basically be in the same place for about a year and a half, fighting a stalemate warfare, very costly, lots of supplies lost, lots of men lost, exactly what Hitler did not want. The Russians used a lot of the same tactics that they had used against Napoleon. They retreated, scorched earth, trading space for time, waiting for the winter to set in, and it worked. Hitler is bogged down in the east, while in the West, Great Britain is starting to attack them on their Western um, flank. Now, how does the United States get involved in this war? Because remember, we were still neutral. Well, we had been monitoring what, the, what Japan was doing in the Pacific since the 30s. Uh, and ultimately, we uh, had intercepted um, a coded message and broke the Japanese secret codes. So we knew that they were preparing for war with British Malaya or an, an attempted invasion of the Philippines. These were logical targets for attack. The Philippines belonged to the United States at this point in time. The United States had gained the Philippines back when um, we won the Spanish-American War in the early 1900s. And so we decided that we would start to amass our fleet on our westernmost naval base in the Pacific, just in case our colony, basically, the Philippines was attacked. So we started to amass our fleet um, in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, just in case the Japanese did invade the Philippines. Japan was monitoring our movements as well. And when they noticed us amassing our fleet at Pearl Harbor, they made the decision to attack the United States on U.S. soil. On December 7th, 1941, Japan surprise attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, hoping to destroy the U.S. fleet that was stationed there. This was the day that will live in infamy. The next day, the United States enters the war, declaring war on Japan 
three days after that, Germany declares war on the United States. Remember, Hitler had added Japan to the Axis Alliance, thinking that if the United States entered, or when the United States entered, we would he would rather us be fighting a two-front war, both in the Pacific and in Europe. And thinking we would probably focus on the Pacific first, since we were, you know, attacked directly there. But when he declared war on us on December 11th, we decided to take a different approach. Here are some pictures of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Japan's strike against the American naval base climaxed in long series of mutually antagonistic acts. In initiating economic sanctions, which we did against Japan starting in 1935, that oil embargo I talked about, the United States undertook actions that were widely recognized in Washington as carrying gray risks, risks for war. Now, yes, the U.S. wanted revenge against Japan, but we adopted a get Germany first plan with the Allies once we had joined with Great Britain and now the Soviet Union. We saw Hitler as the bigger threat, and we needed to knock him out first before concentrating all our forces on Japan. And this is exactly what Hitler was not intending to happen. He was surprised that we did this. Ultimately, the United States will join the Allied powers. As we know, the Soviet Union has now joined the Allied powers. So it's important to recognize that by December 1941, this is a, an entirely different war than it had been just in June of 1941. In June of 1941, it was Great Britain against the Axis powers. By December of 1941, just six months later, it is Great Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union versus the Axis powers. It is a completely different war. So now what? Well, Great Britain proposed an invasion through Northern Africa and Italy in order to attack the Axis powers. So the allies, the Great Britain and the United States, the Western allies, I should say, decided they are going to attack Hitler and Mussolini through Europe's soft underbelly, if you will. We knew that Italy was the weaker link of the Axis powers, and we decided that that would be the best approach to attack Hitler. So that's where we begin our European theater of the war. On November 1942 through May 1943, the North African campaign ultimately was defined by the German defeat at the Battle of El Alamein in Egypt. 1942 is a key turning point in the war. You could argue that it started really by December of 1941, once the Soviet Union and both the Soviet Union and the United States had entered the war on the side of the Allies, because that allowed for this 1942 year to be such a turning point year. There are a series of battles that happen in 1942 that ultimately turn the tides against the Axis powers. The Axis lose their offensive capabilities and are on the defensive from that point forward. So the Battle of El Alamein in Egypt was hard fought. The um, British and the United States combined forces against the Italian and German forces in Northern Africa, and finally a victory for the Allied powers. Opening up the Mediterranean to the Allies, and the Allies then will move into Sicily and then start moving up the Italian boot, rolling back Mussolini's influence um, little bit by little bit. Before El Alamein, we never had a victory. After El Alamein, we never had a defeat, Winston Churchill said. January of 1943 at the Casablanca Conference, FDR and Churchill met once again and agreed on terms of unconditional surrender for the Axis powers. They basically said, we will accept nothing but an unconditional surrender of the Axis powers. They did not invite Stalin to this conference, even though Stalin was technically their ally um, in fighting against Germany. Stalin will not be happy about this when he hears about it. And we will see the seeds of the Cold War that follows World War II starting right here you know, in the last couple of years of World War II. 
They are begrudging allies, in other words. Another key battle that actually began in 1942, another one of those turning point battles, but doesn't end until 1943, is um, the Soviets turning back the Germans at the Battle of Stalingrad. About 2 million were killed in this defining battle in the European theater, but this is where the Soviets were finally breaking the stalemate with the Germans in um, Russia in Soviet territory and finally starting to push the Nazis back, rolling them back out of the territories that they had taken from the Soviet Union. This is a key because now um, Hitler will lose his offensive capability in Eastern Europe and the Soviets are now pushing the um, Nazi influence back out of the Soviet Union and then out of Eastern Europe and then eventually racing to get to Berlin. It will still take a couple of years before that happens, but this is the beginning of that process. So second turning point battle. A third one will be in the Pacific that we'll talk about later. After Stalingrad, the Soviets remained on the offensive for the remainder of the war. Even though there will still be very, very bitter fighting and lots of losses, um, so many losses that Stalin kept arguing with the Western allies, with Great Britain and the United States, that they needed to open another front against the Nazis in the West, perhaps through France, if they could liberate France and then put pressure on the Soviet Union from there, I'm sorry, put pressure on the Nazis from there, perhaps they could make um, Hitler not be able to focus all of his attention on the Soviet Union in Europe. But the Western allies delayed opening up that front, and they will not liberate France and open up that front until June of 1944. Stalin wanted it a full year earlier than that, and he will never forgive the Western allies for that delay. In the meantime, millions of Soviet soldiers will lose their lives in fighting against Hitler, which they see almost completely alone. It's not really alone because, of course, the Western Allies were pushing up through Italy and battling against Mussolini and Hitler in the South. But still, not opening up that Western Front meant, meant that <clears throat> more Nazi forces were able to be put on the Eastern Front against the Soviets for at least another year. By August of 1943, Sicily fell and Mussolini was officially deposed by his own people. Several times he was rescued by uh, the Nazis, but eventually he will be captured by his own people. And as the Allied powers roll through Italy and roll back the, the Axis influence, his own people turned on him. And not only did they depose him, but then they will later execute him. Here is Mussolini um, after being shot. They hung him upside down in Milan on public display, he and his wife, for people to jeer at, throw objects at, spit at, and you name it. Brutal. On November, in November of 1943, there was another conference of the Allies. This time, they did invite Stalin. And so this is the Tehran conference with the big three, FDR, Churchill, and Stalin. And they agreed at Tehran that the Allies would launch simultaneous offensives. This is when finally the um, Western Allies agreed to open up a Western front um, in the European theater against the that the Nazis, but this is November of 1943, and this front will not be opened up until June, which is still too, too long of a delay for Stalin's liking. A lot more antagonism between the different allies as a result. Again, these are the seeds for the Cold War that are being laid. The USSR, as we said, after the Battle of Stalingrad was over by uh, February of 1943, they were able to launch a successful counteroffensive, driving the Germans back across Europe, Eastern Europe. You can see here where it started with Stalingrad, and then by 1943, 
early 44, summer of 44, late 1944, and eventually entering Germany itself by 1945. Their winter and spring. And there's Berlin, that's where they're headed. As stated before, at the Tehran conference, it was decided that the Western Front would finally be activated, uh, focusing on not only securing Italy, which will be secured by the beginning of 1944, but also focusing on perhaps opening that Western Front by liberating France. In June of 1944, the Western Allies, meaning the Great Britain and the United States, captured the city of Rome despite the efforts by Italians and Germans to defend the peninsula first. FDR said, yesterday on June 4th, 1944, Rome fell to American and Allied troops. The first of the Axis capitals is now in our hands, one up and two to go. Though very difficult, the Italian campaign opened up Europe by diverting some of Hitler's soldiers from northern France, which will allow for the D-Day invasion to be more possible, as we will discuss in the next couple of slides. There's the diversion of forces. Just a couple of days after Rome was secured in Italy, on June 6, 1944, the D-Day invasion of Normandy began, Operation Overlord. This was a combined effort of the United States, Great Britain, and Canada that opened up a second front in Western Europe against the Germans. There will be a series of beaches that will be stormed by the Allied forces um, on, on Normandy Beach in Northern France. Here are some pictures of the Allied forces as they enter the French cities. Here's a picture of the Allied forces as they are motoring to, across the English Channel from England to Normandy to storm those beaches. And here they are waiting to storm the beach. This is as they are exiting the, the boats and storming the beach. Yes, they met bitter fire as they were approaching. More men swimming towards the beach. These are actual photographs from the D-Day invasion. More photos of storming the beach. And as you can see, many will not survive this storming of the beach. This There was bitter fighting to get on the beach. Here's some medics trying to help their comrades. Here are some of the areas that they were taking. There was, they were trying to scale the cliffs. You can see the United States flag there after that area was secured. And you can see some Nazi soldiers up at the top being taken as prisoners. Here is a very famous picture once the beach was secured by the Allies. The Allies did meet very heavy resistance on D-Day, but with the help from the French underground, basically a resistance movement that was still in France that was fighting against the German occupation the entire time the Germans had occupied France. The French underground in Paris aided the Allied powers, giving them information, sneaking out through coded messages, uh, information about German troop movements and where they were located and um, areas of vulnerability that could be um, exploited by the Allies. Finally, Paris was freed by August of 1944. A lot of bitter fighting will happen following this though. It was not the end. December of 1944, the Nazis will launch their last ditch offensive on the Western European theater front. This will happen in Belgium, in the forest, at what is called the Battle of the Bulge. He almost succeeded, but the Allies were able to hold the line and ultimately force the Germans back. 
here are some pictures from the Battle of the Bulge. Heavy, heavy casualties. And there is the bulge in the um, in the Allied lines. You can see where the Germans were able to push in that bulge, and then the Allied powers will have to push back. It's a lot, a lot of bitter fighting in the snow, in the woods, um, at, um, throughout Belgium. The Battle at Bastogne is probably one of the most vicious ones. If you're ever interested in watching um, some depictions of this, uh, the Band of Brothers episodes are really good about the D-Day invasion and the Battle of Bastogne as well. Here's the have the German troop movements for, for their bulge in the Allied lines. By February of 1945, the Battle of the Bulge was over and the Allies had secured themselves. The Big Three will meet again, this time at Yalta on Soviet turf. The Yalta Conference was where the, the Big Three will meet to discuss the reorganization of Europe after the war, because by this point, victory was pretty much certain, at least in, in Europe. The Nazis, we know Mussolini had already fallen and the Nazis are very close to being defeated. FDR said, I just have a hunch that Stalin is not that kind of man, and I think that if I give him everything I possibly can and ask for nothing from him in return, he won't try to annex anything and will work with me for a world of democracy and peace. FDR was wrong. Stalin was very bitter about that Western Front being delayed, being opened, and Stalin had said at Yalta that he had no intention of leaving the Eastern European territories that the Soviets had already entered into and freed from Nazi control. He had said that the Soviets would remain there and they would take those territories, if you will, as payment for all the losses that they suffered at the hands of the Nazis. By March of 1945, the Allied troops had reached the borders of Germany on both sides, the British and the um, French now and the United States on the west and the Soviets um, on the east. They So they joined together to march towards Berlin. And it really was a race for Berlin. Will the Soviets get there first on the east or will the Western Allies get there first? The Soviets got there first. The Allies will launch massive aerial strikes on German cities because even though it seemed that the Germans had lost the war, the Nazis had lost the war, Hitler, of course, refused to give in. So the Allies uh, air forces will launch massive aerial attacks similar to what the Nazis had done on Great Britain in the Battle of Britain. They will target civilian populations as well. And these aerial assaults on German cities will really destroy most of the infrastructure and the architecture throughout these major German cities. There are, here are some pictures. Here's the uh, Dresden after the firebombing had happened. Here's more Dresden dead bodies, civilians and combatants. Here's Cologne. Here's Nuremberg. Upon entering Germany, the Allies saw atrocities of the Holocaust as concentration camps were liberated. I'll talk more about this in class as well. Hitler's new order really began in 1940 and continued through 1945. His new order was the genocide of the Jews, gypsies, Jehovah Witnesses, and captured communists. This was because he was not having the effect that he wanted. He could not force Great Britain to capitulate in 1940, and he started to attack the Soviet Union and got bogged down in the Soviet Union by 1941. So Hitler argued that he needed to clean house in the territories that he already controlled in Europe by cleansing the area of non-area blood. The businesses and properties were attacked and confiscated. Crystal Nacht is an example of this that you'll read about in your textbook. The Jews also had to register with government authorities and wear yellow ID stars, Star of David. In Poland, Jews were forced to live in ghettos like the Warsaw and the Krakow ghettos. 
before they were moved to concentration camps. They were deprived of adequate supplies. Several families were crammed into single apartments. And then they were shipped to concentration camps as the slave workforce in Poland. The final solution to the Jewish problem, the Holocaust, as it's sometimes known, began in late 1941 when the stalemate in the East began for the Nazis and there were no more territories they could gain in the West. The formal plan came at the Wannsee Conference in 1942. Six death camps were built in Poland in addition to hundreds of concentration camps to deal with the Jewish problem. Auschwitz was the most notorious of the death camps. About one million people died at Auschwitz alone. In total, about six million Jews were killed during the Holocaust. That was approximately two thirds of the pre-war Jewish population. Between five and six million others were also murdered in the Holocaust, including political prisoners, Jehovah's Witnesses, gypsies or Roma, and others that were considered undesirables in the German nation. Here are some numbers, figures, including refugees and the victims. Note that this does not include victims killed between 1933 and 39. These are just the um, numbers between 1939 and the end of the war. The rest of the world largely ignored the Holocaust while millions of Jews were sent to concentration camps and then to death camps. This is the view of the entrance of the main camp of Auschwitz, Auschwitz I. The gate bears the motto, work makes one free. The irony of that. Here are some pictures from the concentration camps, women on the top, men on the bottom. And if any of you have ever read Night by Elie Wiesel, um, the bottom picture where the men are in the barracks, there's um, Elie Wiesel is in that picture. He is in the um, middle rung on the far right end, the very middle. In April of 1945, the Allied powers had reached Berlin, both the Western Allies and the Soviets. The Soviets actually got there a, a week or so before the Western Allies did. And on April 30th, Hitler determined that he was not going to be captured by the Allies. So instead, he committed suicide, knowing the end was near. This happened on April 30th, 1945. A few days later, Italy officially surrendered to the Allies, May 2nd, 1945. By May 7th, 1945, Germany, the officials that were still, had not committed suicide, had not followed suit and committed suicide like Hitler had done, officially um, surrender. May 7th or May 8th, depending on who you ask, is known as VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. Now let's talk a bit about the Pacific theater of the war. Despite some Japanese successes in the months after Pearl Harbor, December of 1941, the U.S. was able to turn the tide of the war in the Pacific theater as we move into 1942. Japan took Guam, Wake, the Philippines, Hong Kong, British Malaya, and the Dutch East Indies and even pushed into China. In 1942, they controlled all that you see in red. This was significant. They had taken the Philippines. They were able to take it before we were able to respond because we were still licking our wounds from the attack on Pearl Harbor. In the Philippines, Japanese soldiers forced American and Filipino prisoners um, on the Bataan Death March where 12,000, over 12,000 died. Brutal treatment by the Japanese. Dana Rohrbacher, US Congresswoman in 2001 said this, they were beaten and they were starved as they marched. Those who fell were bayoneted. 
Some of those who fell were beheaded by Japanese officers who were practicing with their samurai swords from horseback. The Japanese culture at that time reflected the view that any warrior who surrendered had no honor, thus was not to be treated like a human being. Thus, they were not committing crimes against human beings. The Japanese soldiers at that time felt they were dealing with subhumans and animals. The Japanese expansion finally was checked in the Coral Sea in 1942. This is the third key battle of 1942 that I mentioned before I would talk about later. At the Battle of Midway Island. The Battle of the Coral Sea and the Battle of Midway Island. Two key battles in 1942. Coral Sea Battle, May of 1942, Midway, June of 1942. So even though there are two battles, I consider it the third battle, quote unquote, of 1942 that turned the tide against the Axis powers. From this point forward, Japan will be on the defensive. They have lost their offensive capability. The target Tokyo eventually. The U.S. began an island hopping campaign after those two key battles in 1942, bypassing fortified islands, but taking nearby islands, then bombing them and starving them of supplies. One by one, we roll back the Japanese influence in the Pacific Rim. Target was Tokyo, hoping to force them into unconditional surrender. If, if we needed to invade, we would. By 1942, like I said, the U.S. also won another key battle at Guadalcanal, very bitter fighting at Guadalcanal, preventing the Japanese from expanding into Oceania, into Australia. You see it's located there near the Solomon Islands. Bitter fighting happening at Guadalcanal. Lots of heavy casualties on both sides. In 1943, the U.S. took Tar Tarara and McKean and the Gilbert Islands, and in 1944 took the Marshall Islands. Bitter, bitter fighting. By 1944, the U.S. also took the Marianas Islands and won at the Battle of the Philippine Sea. This is when the U.S. finally retook the Philippines. Here are some pictures, naval battles, babies as casualties, heavy, heavy fighting, air fights and naval fights. The U.S. began a 24-7 bombing campaign over Tokyo and other parts of the Japanese mainland as well, hoping to force the Japanese government to capitulate into unconditional surrender before we had to make the decision whether or not we would invade the island. On March 9, 1945, the U.S. firebombed Tokyo, killing over 83,000 people in the process, most of which were civilians. See some pretty gruesome pictures here. This is from the air, what Tokyo looked like with after the firebombing. Here's before and after, lots of devastation, lots of casualties, even children. Also in March of 1945, the island of Iwo Jima was captured after a 25 day assault. About 7,000 Americans died there and 18,000 Japanese were killed. The fighting in the Pacific was very violent and very bitter. The Japanese refused to surrender. They would rather die than surrender. And so that's why the casualties were so heavy. Here's more pictures of Iwo Jima. And of course, the, mo the very famous picture of the United States after we had won the Battle of Iwo Jima, raising the flag. Between April and June 1945, the Japanese island of Okinawa was captured by the U.S. 
it took that long to capture this small, small island just to the east of Taiwan, as you see there marked on the map. There's a little tiny island, but again, Mark showed how bitter the fighting could be. The Japanese refusing to surrender. They would rather every single man die than surrender. And not just men, women and children as well. Civilian population were also part of this. The Japanese island of Okinawa was eventually captured by the U.S. with a combined 130,000 killed, Japanese and U.S killed in just this one little island. This was a turning point moment. After this bitter fighting and so many dying in this one little island, the United States government had to make a decision of whether or not it was going to be feasible to invade the island of Japan or if we should use a new weapon that we had developed that was in our arsenal. Here is some of the bitter, bitter fighting that happened on Okinawa, U.S. soldiers. More fighting. Heavy, heavy casualties. It's called, this was the USS Bunker Hill ship. The Japanese Navy had been destroyed, but kamikaze pilots sank many ships. Kamikaze pilots, of course, were the Japanese pilots that would fly their own planes into ships to try to sink our ships, committing suicide in the process. Here's the USS Bunker Hill that was attacked by kamikaze pilots. Devastating. You see the kamikaze pilot coming in up there on the upper left. Meanwhile, FDR had died in office and his vice president, Harry Truman, had to assume control. Right here at the bitter end of the war, the last couple of months of the war, we have a new president. And not only that, somehow Winston Churchill lost um, in an election and was replaced as prime minister by Clement Attlee. So in July of 1945, the Potsdam Conference, where the Allies um, meet once again to decide what to do these final days of the war. This, of course, is after the war in Europe was already done, because this is July 1945. At the Potsdam Conference, the Allies issued an ultimatum to Japan, surrender or be destroyed. This is where it was determined that the new weapon that we had been working on would be utilized on Japan rather than us trying to invade Japan. This new weapon would be the world's first atomic bomb. On July 16, 1945, the Manhattan Project in the United States tested our atomic bomb weaponry that we had been working on near Alamogordo, New Mexico. J. Robert Oppenheimer was the developer of this weapon along with Enrico Fermi. We had been working on this bomb thinking that we would use it against Germany. Germany was also working on a similar atomic bomb, but Germany was defeated before the bomb was ready. This is where the, the test bomb was exploded in New Mexico. Neil, Niels Bohr, in a letter to FDR, said, a weapon of an unparalleled power is being created which will completely change all future conditions of warfare. This is right before FDR passed in April of 1945. So FDR will never have to make the decision whether or not to use this, this um, terrible but very effective weapon. That, will be, that decision will be left for Truman. Japan was given this ultimatum, like I said, at the Potsdam Conference, and Japan refused to surrender. And an attack on Jap the Japanese mainland might mean millions of casualties. So this is why the decision was made to drop the atomic bomb, even though that would mean more civilians would end up dying, um, more Japanese civilians would end up dying. The, the thought was that ultimately it would save more 
um, allied lives as well in the long run, perhaps more Japanese lives. On August 6, 1945, the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan, killing 180,000 people instantly. There will be many more that will suffer from radiation poisoning for years after. Here's a picture of Hiroshima being attacked and the mushroom cloud that the bomb produced. The destruction. Awful. Since Japan didn't surrender right after, on August 9th, three days later, another atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, Japan, killing 80,000 people. Here are pictures from Nagasaki. Destruction. After that, on August 10th, Japan did surrender with one condition that Emperor Hirohito be allowed to remain on the throne. Hirohito said, the enemy now possesses a new and terrible weapon with the power to destroy many innocent lives and to do incalculable damage. Should we continue to fight, not only would it result in an ultimate collapse and obliteration of the Japanese nation, but also it would lead to the total extinction of human civilization. Such being the case, how are we to save the millions of our subjects or to atone ourselves before the hallowed spirits of our imperial ancestors? They had no way to know that those were the only two bombs that we had created up to that point. The Cold War begins. After World War II is over, after the surrender of Japan, the relationship between the Western allies, in particular the United States and Great Britain, and the Soviet Union continued to harden. We know that Stalin was angry that that Western front was not opened up soon enough to his liking. And ultimately, those will be the seeds of the Cold War that will follow, that will continue for a generation to come. This Cold War is not a hot war, is not where there are active um, fighting going on between the nations, but instead um, this hardening of lines, um, it's a lot of it is a war of diplomacy and eventually some hot spots in the war where it'll be wars by proxy between the um, communist forces and the free forces of the world. The world will be divided between communism and freedom, ultimately, communism and democracy. The U.S. and the USSR were really the only superpowers left after World War II, and the trouble seemed in, imminent between them. The United States was going to uh, dedicate itself to helping to rebuild um, Western Europe to try to save it from falling prey to a communist takeover, because Western Europe was so war-torn that, as we know, economically depressed nations are more vulnerable to totalitarian takeovers. And we were concerned that, you know, the only totalitarian dictatorship that was left would be the left-wing variety of communism, Soviet communism. We had defeated right-wing totalitarianism, but left-wing was still there. And, of course, they had been our begrudging allies during the war against the right-wing totalitarian regime of the Nazis. The U.S. State Department report said, the reins of world leadership are fast slipping from Britain's competent but now very weak hands after the war. These reins will be picked up either by the United States or by Russia. The U.S. spent the Cold War attempting to stop the spread of communism. We were paranoid it would otherwise consume us and all of the free world. So ultimately, we felt that if we did not stop communism where it already was located, that it would eventually continue to, as domino effect, take over the entire world. So this became our diplomatic policy, our foreign policy, for the next 50 years. 
the containment of communism, containing it where it already exists, not letting it spread any further. The USSR spent the Cold War dealing with par a paranoid fear of their own, the paranoid fear of being attacked. It had happened twice in the last 150 years, so what would make it not happen again? So they saw the seizing of territory in Eastern Europe as creating a buffer zone between themselves and the Western world that seemed hell-bent on destroying communism. We saw Napoleon do it. We saw Hitler do it. So the U.S. and the Soviet Union have incompatible political and economic systems, and they both see the other as the potential of destroying the world as we know it. The U.S. is a democracy, of course, with a capitalist economy. USSR is a communist dictatorship with government-led command economy. Seeds for the Cold War were sown with Rush, the Russian Revolution already back in 1917. Remember, the U.S. and the other allies in World War I supported the white movement over the Red Army in the Russian Civil War. Here is a picture of American troops in Russia during the Russian Civil War in 1918 as support for the white movement against the Red Army. The U.S. did not recognize the USSR formally until 1933 as, a, as an accepted government. And we were, were um, World War II allies only because we had common enemies in the Nazis. The U.S. and Britain were slow to open that second front, as I said before, against Germany that would have helped the USSR, taken some pressure off the USSR, handling the brunt of the Nazi um, army for so long. And Stalin would never forgive the West for that delay. The U.S. and Britain also didn't inform the Soviets that we had been working on an atomic weapon. We had shared that information with the British, but we did not share it with the Soviets. Though Stalin's spies kept him informed of the Manhattan Project. And he will be angry about that as well. Are we really truly allies if they were not sharing all of our information? We didn't trust him. He was a begrudging ally. The U.S. ended the vital Lend-Lease program with the USSR also in 1945, once the outcome of the war was certain. So the money was cut off to help the Soviets fight against the Nazis because the Nazis had been defeated. The U.S. denied the USSR's request also for six billion reconstructive dollars, but, gave, but we did give 3.75 billion to Britain. So if we were giving money to help the build, rebuild the, um, and you know, the destruction from World War II to one ally, why weren't we doing it to the other, the Soviet Union would ask. Well, that's because they were not a democracy. That's why we didn't. And again, the seeds of the Cold War were sown. At the Yalta conference that took place in the spring of 1945, Stalin was made to promise that he would hold free elections in the Soviet-controlled portions of Eastern Europe that he had occupied as he rolled back the Nazi forces in places like Poland and Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia and Hungary, but he will never deliver on that promise. Stalin had said, for the Russian people, the question of Poland is not only a question of honor, but also a question of security. Throughout history, Poland has been the corridor through which the enemy has passed into Russia. Poland is a question of life and death for Russia. Poland, he said, must belong to Russia. Stalin had hoped that the Eastern European countries that were under Soviet control after they had been liberated from Nazi control in those last two years of the war, he hoped that those, those areas could act like a buffer zone against the West, that he would continue to have influence in those regions, propping up communist governments in all of those areas that would be 
um, complicit with the Soviet government. Stalin said, whoever occupies a territory also imposes his own social system. Everyone imposes his own system as far as his armies can reach. It cannot be otherwise. After World War II, Germany was divided into four what was supposed to be temporary occupational zones controlled by all four of the Allies. Remember, after France was liberated, they were now one of the Allies again. Okay, so a zone for the United States, a zone for the USSR, a zone for the UK or Great Britain, and a zone for France. The idea was to occupy these parts of Germany to help rebuild them so they would not, to denazify them too, so they would not have a resurgence of this maniacal kind of nationalism um, and aggression again. The U.S. wanted Germany reunited as soon as possible, but the USSR, with no reparations, refused to relinquish control over the eastern part of Germany that they controlled. You can also see the city of Berlin, which was actually located in the Soviet realm of Germany, was also divided into zones of occupation as the capital city. In 1948, the Berlin airlift was where the U.S. overcame the Soviet blockade of Western Berlin by delivering supplies to the city using airplanes for almost a year. This was called Operation Vittles. What had happened was Stalin had um, blockaded the Western part of Berlin. Remember, he, Berlin was located in the Eastern part, but the Western half of the city of Berlin was in the hands of the Western allies. He blockaded all around the, the western part portion of Berlin to um, not allow any food or water or any kind of supplies from um, the west into that area. And in order to save our people who were on the ground, our occupational forces, we had to do airlifts for about 11 months to try to break the back of the Soviet blockade. What Stalin had hoped is that we would back off and that he would be able to absorb and take all of the capital city of Berlin for the Soviet realm. We did not allow that to happen. Molotov said, what happens to Berlin happens to Germany. What happens to Germany happens to Europe. So the Soviets thought if they could take all of Berlin, they could eventually take all of Germany and then take all of Europe. We were not going to let that happen. We just came out of a world war where we had a totalitarian dictator trying to take over everything. We're not going to let that happen. There is no predictability in maintaining our position in Berlin, and it must not be elevated on that basis. We are convinced that our remaining in Berlin is essential to our prestige in Germany and in Europe. Whether for good or bad, it has become a symbol of the American intent. General Clay, United States. We did not back down. Winston Churchill, who was out of office at this point, but was campaigning to run for another um, uh, term as prime minister, which he will get in the 50s, commented that an imaginary line, which he referred to as the Iron Curtain, now separated Soviet-controlled Eastern Europe from the democracies in Western Europe. This Iron Curtain would ultimately be the showdown where the Cold War uh, would take place for the next generation. Winston Churchill said, from Stettin in the Balkans to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that lies the ancient capitals of Central and Eastern Europe. U.S. President Harry Truman adopted a policy known as the containment policy for the United States. Firm containment of the Soviet expansion would limit the communist threat. So we would not allow, contain, um, not allow communism to spread any further, but instead contain it where it already existed. This will be sort of the basis of our foreign policy initiatives for the next 
generation. Truman said, with patient but firm and vigilant containment, the U.S. could halt Soviet expansion. The Truman Doctrine, containing communism through financial and military means, became the U.S. policy through the Cold War. And it was the first piece in the puzzle of the containment policy. There will actually be three parts to the containment policy. The Truman Doctrine, 1947, is the first piece. It is the ideology of the containment policy. In 1947, Truman provided $400 million U.S. dollars to help Greece and Turkey resist communism. This was the beginning of what would be the second part of the containment policy, the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan sent 12.5 billion U.S. dollars over four years to 16 cooperating nations in Europe to spur on economic growth and to help them rebuild after World War II. This was done as an investment for the United States. We felt if we economically propped up these former, the, these, these allies of ours, these, these war-torn countries, that they would be less likely to fall prey to communist takeovers. So we will pour billions of dollars into Western Europe to keep them from falling to communism. That was part of our containment policy for European recovery supplied by the United States of America. This we hope would eventually pay off in the long run because if they had thriving economies in the future, they would be better trade partners for us. And ultimately it would pay off. The Marshall Plan increased the American political and economic influence, however, in Western Europe. We will stop the spread of communism in Europe. This will be known as the economic miracle for Europe. And it's largely due to our investment. But it also set, showed that we would never again go back to a policy of splendid isolationism. We would take on a larger role in world politics from this point forward. The Marshall Plan was a lifeline to a sinking man. We grabbed the lifeline with both hands, a British politician stated. The third part of the containment policy would be the military part. So the first part, the ideology, Truman Doctrine. Second part, the economic part, the Marshall Plan. And the third part, the military part, the creation of NATO the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, starting in 1949. The U.S., Britain, France, Belgium, and Luxembourg formed the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in 1949. This would be a, um, an alliance, basically, that stated if any of the nations that belonged to it were attacked, it would be like an attack on any of them, which means the United States would come to the aid. NATO was a mutual defense agreement. We didn't call it an alliance, even though that's technically what it was. A mutual defense agreement, with the U.S. no longer avoiding entangling alliances. We're taking on a world role at this point. And the membership grew over the years, adding more to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, even when they're not even anywhere close to the North Atlantic region. The parties of NATO agreed that an armed attack against one or more of them in Europe or North America shall be considered an attack against them all. Consequently, they agree that if such an armed attack occurs, each of them, in exercise of the right of individual or collective self-defense, will assist the party or parties being attacked individually and in concert with the other parties. Such action as it deems necessary, including the use of armed force to restore and maintain the security of the North Atlantic area. NATO is the most important alliance in the history of the world, Barack Obama said. He was our U.S. president from 2009 to 2017. In 1955, 
USSR kind of countered the creation of NATO by creating what was called the Warsaw Pact among its satellite nations to counter NATO. Basically, it was the USSR saying if NATO or any member of any country came in and tried to roll back the communist influence in any of these areas, they would have to take on the Soviet Union. The US and the USSR and its rival blocs engaged in a Cold War that would last the next 45 years. This Cold War will have not a lot of active fighting, lots of chilly diplomacy, lots of threats, lots of arms race. We will see atomic weaponry being built up on both sides, nuclear weaponry um, for the next 45 years. We'll talk about all of that in the um, coming slides. The Cold War grows. Cold War tensions were inconsistent from 1945 to 1991, but proxy wars, an arms race, and even a space race led to fears of mutual assured destruction. If one attacks and the other, the other has to attack as well, and it could ultimately lead to the end of the world when nuclear weapons are involved. The U.S. emerged from World War II as the only atomic power, but in 1949, the Soviets tested their own first atomic bomb. And now both sides of the Cold War have atomic capability. Now we are all sons of bitches, Dr. Kenneth Bainbridge said. Excuse my French. The USSR will be turning out long range missiles like sausages, Nikita Khrushchev said. And this is the beginning of the arms race. By 1953, both the US and the USSR had hydrogen bombs. An arms race began as both nations built stockpiles of increasingly powerful nuclear weapons. Armageddon is now possible. Mutually assured destruction and the end of the world is possible. A hydrogen bomb uses fusion and is 450 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, Japan. Nuclear technology. The arms race raised tensions and caused fear of nuclear Armageddon throughout the Cold War. But the threat of Armageddon, even though both sides were stockpiling these nuclear weapons, the threat of Armageddon kept those weapons from being used. But lots of threats and lots of tension for 45 years. Nuclear weapons. So the USSR had 13,000. The U.S. had 10,000, and it'll increase moving forward. Here are more pictures of the destruction that can be caused by nuclear weapons, the testing of the nuclear weapons throughout the world, death and destruction. You can see how it could lead to the end of the world. Now let's talk about some hot spots that happened in the Cold War. The Cold War actually heated up in Asia. We see some hot spots in the Cold War in Asia, and they became proxy wars between democracy or the West and communism or the East. We will start with talking about how China falls to communism. In the early 1900s, backing up a little bit, Chinese nationalism grew. As the Qing dynasty declined, there were many that we talked about in earlier lectures that wanted to replace the Qing dynasty with a republic and end the foreign domination that had resulted at the end of the Qing dynasty with the unequal treaties in the mid to late 1800s. And instead they wanted to start have a, a Republican government and create economic growth of their own. 
an independent China. In 1911, the Qing Dynasty was officially ended with an overthrowing of the emperor, Emperor Pugi, the last Chinese emperor, and he was replaced by a Chinese republic that was led by a reformer named Sun Yat-sen. Here's the, the Declaration of the Republic of China. China was very weak after World War I, and, um, which was under the Republic throughout the World War I. Peasants were struggling, foreign powers were still meddling in the affairs of the Chinese, increasing influence in China, and Sun Yat-sen was forced to step down. In 1925, Sun Yat-sen was replaced by another reformer named Chiang Kai-shek. Um, his Guangdian, or nationalist government, was supported by the middle class and by the foreigners. So he collaborated with the foreigners, much like the Japanese had done in their industrial process that they uh, experienced in the late 1800s. Many people saw the nationalist government as corrupt and controlled by foreign nations. So some of those freedom fighters in China will move a different direction. Many Chinese peasants were attracted instead to Mao Zedong and the Communist Party in China. Mao promised land reform. The government, the current government, seemed corrupt and in the pocket of the Western imperialist nations. Mao said, the force of the peasantry is like that of the raging winds and driving rain. They will bury beneath them all forces of imperialism, militarism, corrupt officialdom, village bosses, and evil gentry. Mao was kind of like Lenin was in um, Russia. Uh, at the end of the, of for the First World War. Mao also won the support of women. He rejected the inequalities of traditional Confucian teachings, which made women subordinate. He opposed foot binding and arranged marriages. So a lot of women supported Mao as a result. Women hold up half the sky, Mao said. A 22-year civil war broke out in China after World War I between the nationalists, or the republic, and the communists. 22-year civil war, bitter, bitter fighting. 1.8 to 3.5 million were killed. We don't know the exact numbers because so many died and were put in mass graves that we'll never really know for sure. In 1934, Mao's communist forces fled the nationalist forces. They were forced out on what was called the Long March that was 6,000 miles long, allowing Mao to spread his message throughout China, even though he had been defeated in 1934. This will not be the end of Mao. Instead, as he goes on the Long March, as he and the communists go on the Long March, forced out by the Republican forces, he will gain more and more support among the peasantry. This will come home to roost after World War II is over. Mao's army successfully used hit-and-run guerrilla tactics rather than face the nationalist army in the long run. Mao said, the revolution is not a dinner party, nor an, e nor an essay, nor a painting, nor a piece of embroidery. It cannot be advanced softly, gradually, carefully, considerately, <clears throat> respectfully, politely, plainly, and modestly. A revolution is an insurrection, an act of violence by which one class overthrows another. The nationalists, the communists, and the Japanese forces all fought for control of China during World War II. It was a mess. It was a basket case. Who was going to ultimately take full power? The communists and the nationalists somewhat joined forces to push out the Japanese to fight against the Japanese occupation, but they did not get along. And so it would not remain united after the war is over. <laughs>
1949, the communists defeated the nationalists and Mao established the People's Republic of China, a communist dictatorship in China. And this took the world by surprise. The United States commitment to the containment policy was shocked because we felt as if, quote, we lost China to the communists, end quote. Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists fled to Taiwan and established the Republic of China there. Taiwan and China are still enemies today. Taiwan is basically the old Chinese Republic in exile while China is controlled by the communist regime still to this day. There's uh, Mao kicking Chiang Kai-shek out of China into Taiwan. Mao sought to transform China from an agricultural society into a modern industrial nation. The graffiti on this wall says Mao Zedong is the Chinese people's savior. So propaganda is a big part of this. He's going to convince the, all the Chinese that he is the answer and he is the key to transforming China into a modern industrial nation. Mao is sometimes seen as the Chinese Stalin um, when it comes to industrializing China. Literacy will increase. Landowning and business classes were eliminated. Remember, communism wants to eliminate classes. And peasants were given health care. All at the behest of the control of the government in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. Mao established a one-party communist dictatorship and denied people basic human rights. Mao said, if there is to be revolution, there must be a revolutionary party. Without a revolutionary party, without a party built on communist revolutionary theory and in the communist revolutionary style, it is impossible to lead the working class and the broad masses of the people in defeating imperialism and its running dogs. Mao also said, don't you want to abolish state power, meaning nationalism? Yes, we do, but not right now. We cannot do it yet. Why? Because imperialism still exists, because domestic reaction still exists, because classes still exist in our country. We must perfect communism at home first before it can be exported to the rest of the world. Sound familiar, anyone? Women gained equality under the law, technically, and worked alongside men, but they were not truly equal. Mao said, enable every woman who can work to take her place on the labor front under the principle of equal pay for equal work. It sounds good, but it's not what it seemed. In 1958, Mao announced a policy called the Great Leap Forward, calling for increased agricultural and industrial output. China's economy was weak and it needed to be strengthened if they were going to dominate on the world stage. Take steel as the key link, leap forward in all fields. Mao created communes where groups of people lived and worked together. They held property in common, similar to Stalin's collectivized farms. Mao said, there is a serious tendency towards capitalism among the well-to-do peasants. This tendency will become rampant if we, if we in the slightest way neglect political work among the peasants during the cooperative movement and for a very long period after. So like Stalin, he said, we need to get rid of those wealthier peasants like the Kulaks were in the Soviet Union in order to really revolutionize the lower classes living on the communes, kick out the wealthy peasants. Wheat production will skyrocket, he argued, if we work together on the collective farms. Communes had production quotas, set amounts of farming or industrial output. So similar to Stalin's five-year plans. And it was difficult to meet these quotas 
and many will die in the process, just like with Stalin's five-year plans. The Great Leap Forward failed, ultimately. Commune-based industries turned out poorly made goods. Farm output actually decreased, and about 20 million died in the process. Harvard professor said, enormous amounts of investment produced only modest increases in production or none at all. In short, the Great Leap was a very expensive disaster. Grain production dropped 30% during the Great Leap Forward. So, so much for forward leaping. However, in 1966, Mao wanted to renew the people's loyalty to communism cannot have anybody wavering and establish more equitable society with what he called the cultural revolution. Mao feared intellectuals were running the country, not the peasants and the workers. So schools and colleges were shut down during the cultural revolution. Mao said, Although the bourgeoisie has been overthrown, it is still trying to use the old ideas, culture, customs, and habits of the exploiting classes to corrupt the masses, capture their minds, and endeavor to stage a comeback. The proletariat must do just the opposite. It must meet head on every challenge of the bourgeoisie. At present, our objective is to struggle against and crush those persons in authority who are taking the capitalist road to criticize and repudiate the reactionary bourgeois academic authorities and the ideology of the bourgeoisie and all other exploiting classes and to transform education, literature, and art and all other parts of the superstructure that do not correspond to the socialist economic base so as to facilitate the consolidation and development of the socialist system. Students formed red guards and attacked professors, government officials, and factory managers. So the propaganda worked. The young people were being indoctrinated by Mao. Mao said, the world is yours as well as ours, but in the last analysis, it is yours. You young people, full of vigor and vitality, are in the bloom of life, like the sun at eight or nine in the morning, our hope is placed on you. The world belongs to you. China's future belongs to you. The Red Guard attacked the cemetery of Confucius and hacked the faces off Buddhist statues to um, basically try to diminish the influence of the old Chinese cultural traditions. Mao hoped serving in the Red Guards would create for China's youth the experience of the communist revolution. So it was mandatory to serve in the Red Guards. Mao said, if you want to know the taste of a pear, you must change the pear by eating it yourself. If you want to know the theory and methods of revolution, you must take part in revolution. All genuine knowledge originates in direct experience. The Cultural Revolution was, however, disastrous. Attacks on intellects, intellectuals led to economic slowdown. China was more isolated as a result, and thousands were executed and imprisoned. Now let's talk a little bit more about how the Cold War spread in Asia. Now that China is a communist nation, it's even more dangerous and the containment policy will be challenged even more in the hot spots of Asia, hot spots in the Cold War. Let's turn to Korea. In 1950 to 53, the Korean War represents the first major proxy war of the Cold War between the communists and the free. Proxy or limited wars involved one superpower, the US or the USSR, and was limited to conventional, not nuclear conflict in one region. Traditional warfare, conventional warfare, not using the nukes 
Korea was divided after World War II, the Communist North and the Democratic South. The North fell to a communist takeover after the expulsion of the Japanese at the end of the war and a uh, communist government um, ultimately filled that power vacuum. And now that China, after 1949, when China became a communist nation, um, North Korea was kind of propped up by the Chinese, that North Korean um, communist government kind of propped up by the Chinese. The South will be propped up by the democratic United States as part of the um, United Nations efforts to also contain communism. In 1950, North Korea suddenly invaded South Korea and nearly took the entire peninsula. And this is what caused the United States through the UN initiative to act and respond. It was part of our containment policy, but we will be sending troops in under the UN flag. 16 United Nations member nations under US leadership agreed to help South Korea. The USSR sent help, but no troops, because they really supported the Northern communists in their hearts. UN troops pushed North Korean troops back to the 38th parallel where they had originally been because containment is to stop communism where it already was, not allow it to spread, not to roll it back from where it already was. So the UN mandate was to push the communists back to the 38th parallel not to roll them back any further. But the UN forces continued north, and this is where they went beyond the UN mandate. When the UN troops under the US direction went beyond the UN mandate and invaded North Korea, that is when the Chinese got involved. A Chinese assault drove the UN troops back to the 38th parallel, and a ceasefire was maintained by 1953, creating a demilitarized zone dividing the two countries between North Korea and South Korea at that same 38th parallel. North Korea still remains a communist nation, friendly with China today, and South Korea still remains free. It's important to know that no peace treaty ended the Korean War. No peace treaty was ever signed. It was a ceasefire only. And tensions in the demilitarized zone and between the two countries remain high today. As a matter of fact, the leader of North Korea declared that the ceasefire was over a few years ago. We'll see what happens from here. That's where the demilitarized zone is supposed to be located. The Cold War, Communist East versus Democratic West. In 1953, Joseph Stalin died after being in charge of the Soviet Union for almost 30 years. And he was replaced by Nikita Khrushchev, who decided to take a different approach to his communist dictatorship. He adopted a policy of de-Stalinization and promised instead a peaceful coexistence with the West. Not friendship, but peaceful coexistence. He was concerned over the influence that Stalin had had having been in power for so long. He was concerned that communism in the Soviet Union had become more about Stalin and less about the ideology of communism. And he wanted to demote the influence of Stalin and instead create a communist Soviet Union that could coexist with the West rather than continuing to raise the up the ante with the nuclear arms race that could bring destruction to the entire world. Khrushchev said, Stalin called everyone who didn't agree with him an enemy of the people. He said that they wanted to restore the old order. And for this purpose, several hundred thousand honest people perished. Everyone lived in fear in those days. Everyone expected that at any moment there would be a knock on the door in the middle of the night, and that knock on the door would prove fatal. People not to Stalin's liking were annihilated. Honest party members 
we know he did the purges, right? Loyal and hard workers for our cause who had gone through the school of revolutionary struggle under Lenin's leadership. This was utter and complete arbitrariness. And now is all things, all this to be forgiven and forgotten? Never. Khrushchev relaxed some of the policies that's, and this sparked rebellions in Eastern Europe against Soviet domination and communism. He had hoped that they would maintain themselves the way they were as allies to the Soviet Union um, with those policies relaxed. He was wrong. They started to say, yeah, we want our freedom. So he's going to have to change his approach and start to go in there and try to put down those rebellions. A Hungarian citizen rebelling against Soviet authority said, from the youngest child to the oldest man, no one wants communism. We've had enough of it, enough of it forever. We shall never again be slaves. However, they will not gain their freedom just yet. But this shows you the beginnings of the um, cracks in the Soviet armor, if you will, it will not come to fruition until Gorbachev is in power. In 1956, there were riots in Poland that led to more autonomy from the USSR and an end to the farm collectives. Władysław Gomolka and the Polish in October. Bread and freedom was the call. In Hungary, Hungary announced free elections and left the Warsaw Pact as well. Khrushchev sent a Red Army in to crush that rebellion though not allowing that to happen. Hungarian flag with the communist coat of arms cut out of it, the symbol of the revolution. Emir Neji, the Hungarian prime minister, ultimately this will be put down by Khrushchev and they will re-solidify Soviet control. Hungarian citizen said, I saw young students who had known nothing of a life under communist and Russian control die for freedom about which they had only heard from others or from their own hearts. I saw a girl of 14 blow up a Russian tank and grandmothers walk up to Russian cannons, Hungarian citizen, but it will be crushed by Khrushchev's forces. Then the Cold War starts to shift to the skies, to space. In 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik the first man-made satellite to orbit the Earth, initiating the space race between the US and the USSR as part of the Cold War initiatives. We were shocked that they could send a satellite into space and we were concerned that they were spying on us 24 seven from that satellite. What if they could weaponize the satellite and send a nuclear weapon to us from that satellite? This, of course, will increase tensions in the Cold War. So, in 1961, the space race heats up even more when the Soviets sent the first man into space, Yuri Gagarin. The United States will counter under uh, uh, under um, President Kennedy, he will swear that by the end of the 60s, we will put a man on the moon. So in 1969, the U.S. puts the first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong. The space race reflected each nation's attempt to prove the merits of their way of life, sought military applications also for space technology. In 1959, President Dwight Eisenhower invited Khrushchev to the U U.S. for talks. The USSR offered disarmament as, cold, as the Cold War seemed to be thawing, but it will heat up within the next year. In 1960, a U-2 spy plane incident ended the talks. The U.S. spy plane was shot down over the USSR and the pilot was captured. Yes, we were flying over their airspace where we should have been and we were spying on them, but they were doing the same to us as well. But this ended the talks that had started in 1959 and the Cold War hardened again. The U-2 incident marked the beginning of the most tense period in Cold War history. 
After the U-2 was shot down by the Soviets and assuming the pilot had died, the U.S. issued a press release noting that an aircraft had gone missing north of Turkey. The report speculated that the pilot might have fallen unconscious while the autopilot was still engaged, even falsely claiming that the pilot reported over the emergency frequency that he was experiencing oxygen difficulties. In reality, the pilot had survived and revealed to the Soviets that he was spying on the USSR. A few days later, Khrushchev announced, I must tell you a secret. When I made my first report, I deliberately did not say that the pilot was alive and well. Now, just look how many silly things the Americans have said. In 1961, the Soviets built the Berlin Wall around the western portion of Berlin that was occupied by the Western forces, keeping people from escaping communism. This wall will symbolize the Iron Curtain throughout Europe, even though it's just in Berlin. It will symbolize that Iron Curtain, keeping the two parts of the world separated, the free part, the democratic part, and the, the communist part. So when this wall comes down in 1989, it is a symbol of the Iron Curtain falling. Here are pictures of that wall separating free and communist Berlin, representing this separation between free and communism in the world. Here's a map surrounded the entirety of Western Berlin. Here's an image of what it was, how it was fortified. In 1962, Khrushchev authorized placement of Soviet nukes in Cuba. Angry over the U-2 incident, angry over a failed attempt to um, re-democratize Cuba. Cuba had become a communist nation in 1959, had um, become friendly with the Soviets. Uh, under President Kennedy, we had launched a um, initiative, a CIA initiative to try to um, overthrow the communist government in Cuba in um, 1961 called the Bay of Pigs. Um, and it was a fiasco, it didn't work. And, and Needless to say, um, not only was Castro in Cuba angry about this, but so was Khrushchev. So Khrushchev in 1962, to sort of counter all of that, authorized the placement of Soviet nukes in friendly to Soviet Union Cuba. This is an island 90 miles off the coast of the U.S., controlled by the communist Fidel Castro. We now have Soviet nukes pointing at us 90 miles off of our coast. And of course, Florida is the most vulnerable to this. Khrushchev said in his memoirs, we had installed enough missiles already to destroy New York, Chicago, and the other huge industrial cities, not to mention the little village like Washington, and not to mention Florida, just 90 miles to the north. After a tense 13-day confrontation with the U.S., the Soviets removed the missiles. The U.S. promised not to attack Cuba, and we also promised to remove our missiles from Turkey that were aimed at the Soviet Union. It was a tense 13-day time where World War III seemed inevitable and the end of the world. The Cuban Missile Crisis, however, ended and ultimately opened the doors to a period known as detente. JFK, who was president at the time, said, to halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba from whatever nation or port will be found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be, will be turned back. We are not at this time, however, denying the necessities of life as the Soviets attempted to do in their Berlin blockade of 1948. Khrushchev said this blockade of navigation in internal waters and airspace constituted an act of aggression, propelling mankind into the abyss of a world nuclear missile war. But as I said, after 13 days of tension, 
the Soviets back down. Mr. President, Khrushchev said, we and you ought not pull on the ends of the rope in which you have tied the knot of war, because the more the two of us pull, the tighter that knot will be tied. You yourself understand perfectly of what terrible forces our countries depose, dispose. Consequently, if there is no intention to tighten that knot and thereby to doom the world to the catastrophe of thermonuclear war, then let us not only relax the forces pulling on the ends of the rope, let us take measures to unite that knot, to, sorry, to untie that knot. We are ready for this, Khrushchev said. Ultimately, Khrushchev in 1964 lost his uh, control over the Soviet Union because he was seen as weak by the Communist Party after the Cuban Missile Crisis when he was forced to back down. And instead, Khrushchev was replaced, replaced by a hardliner named Leonid Brezhnev, who promised re-Stalinization to occur in the Soviet Union and that the USSR could intervene in any communist country if they saw fit. So in 1968, Czechoslovakia's communist leader, Alexander Dubček, initiated reforms, hoping to create what he called socialism with a human face. The action program was freedom of speech, freedom of movement, freedom of debate, freedom of association, and no more random arrests and economic freedoms. Well, Brezhnev didn't like this at all. Brezhnev instead ordered the Red Army to invade Czechoslovakia and re the reform movement was crushed. This is known as the Prague Spring, 1968. Soviets reasserting full control over Czechoslovakia as a satellite state to the Soviet Union. The difference between 1945 and 1968. We also had the Vietnam War going on as a proxy war during the, the 60s. Uh, the Vietnam War proxy war saw the U.S. trying to contain communism, assuming that if it spread anywhere, it could spread everywhere. This was what we called the domino theory. We were worried that if we let Vietnam fall to communism, um, then all these other regions in the vicinity would fall to communism as well. The U.S. ultimately will be in Vietnam for years, but eventually we will withdraw without a clear victory. And when we did that, withdrawing without a clear victory from Vietnam, it meant a superpower kind of lost to a mostly underdeveloped nation, diminishing the U.S. global reputation. So why did we pull out? Well, we had been there for years by the time um, the early 1970s rolled around. And there was a great deal of pressure among the electorate back at home in the United States to end this, what seemed like endless war that was going nowhere. So we adopted a process called Vietnamization, where we tried to train the troops in South Vietnam to fight for themselves without our leadership hoping that they could hold the line and keep South Vietnam from falling to North Vietnam. This, of course, is all after the French had withdrawn from the region as one of their colonies back in the 50s. This is when this all started. Ultimately, Vietnamization did not work and the entire region will fall to communism shortly after we pull out. Howard Zinn, The People's History of the United States said, from 1964 to 1962, the wealthiest and most powerful nation in the history of the world made a maximum military effort with everything short of atomic bombs to defeat a nationalist revolutionary movement in a tiny peasant country and failed. When the United States fought in Vietnam, it was organized modern technology versus organized human beings and the human beings won. The guerrilla tactics of the um, North Vietnamese ultimately won the day. They were able to hold on long enough. And when we pulled out, they take the whole region. In the 1970s, the Cold War began to thaw again. This easing of tensions is known as detente. 
So, so even though Brezhnev was cracking skulls in Czechoslovakia, relations with the West started to thaw a bit under detente. In 1970, detente began with Western German Chancellor Willy Brandt's policy of improving relations with East Germany and Eastern Europe. Ostpolitik. Ostpolitik, excuse me. Willy Brandt, Nobel Peace Prize winner. In 1972, Nixon stunned the world by visiting China to, quote, normalize relations between the two nations. The U.S. actually officially recognized communist China as a true government in 1972 as a result of this visit. Then Nixon visited the USSR, which led to a series of agreements that eased tensions and expanded trade. Nixon said, the issue of war and peace cannot be solved unless we in the United States and the Soviet Union demonstrate both the will and the capacity to put our relationship on a basis consistent with the aspirations of mankind. Nixon and Brezhnev negotiated the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, or SALT Treaty, limiting the number of intercontinental ballistic missiles. In other words, nuclear arms reduction to try to tamp down the nuclear arms race. Detente peaked with the Helsinki Accords that accepted the existing political borders and protected human rights and political freedoms. Unfortunately, shortly after this, detente will come to an end because of some Soviet actions in Afghanistan. In 1979, Brezhnev ignored the Helsinki Accords and invaded Afghanistan, ending detente. Some rebel forces in Afghanistan, which is of course on the border of the Soviet Union, um, wanted to take over the pro-communist government. They wanted to topple the pro-communist government in Afghanistan. And this was seen as an act of war against the Soviet Union who had propped up that Soviet, sorry, that communist regime in Afghanistan for so many years. The U.S. saw the USSR as an aggressive force again, and this proxy war proved very unpopular in Russia as the war dragged on for years and the cost mounted. The U.S. saw the USSR invading Afghanistan as, of course, going against our containment policy, and it was seen as a spread of Soviet influence and a spread of communism. And so as a result, we supported the, quote, freedom fighters in Afghanistan, who were the Mujahideen. Ultimately, the Soviets will have to pull out of Afghanistan. The U.S. responded with massive weapons buildup. A renewal of arms race further strained the Soviet economy as well. In 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev became the new leader of the USSR, and he sought to reform a weaker Soviet economy and a corrupt political system. He wanted to save communism by reforming it, but ultimately his reforms will lead to the um, capitulation or the toppling of the Soviet Union. Gorbachev said, many of you see the solution to your problems in restoring to market mechanisms in place of direct planning, meaning communism, market um, economy rather than communism. Some of you look at the market as a lifesaver for your economies, but comrades, you should not think about lifesavers, but about the ship and the ship is socialism. He was not trying to end socialism. He was not trying to end communism. He was trying to save it. It was economically strapped, trying to maintain control over all of those satellite states, trying to keep a military presence there, trying to keep up with the arms race, was bankrupting the Soviet Union. So he was trying to 
uh, salvage the Soviet Union through reform, not end communism, but ultimately it will have the reverse effect. The USSR first pulled out of Afghanistan, and this meant that the superpower, the USSR, lost to a mostly undeveloped nation, diminishing the Soviets' global reputation, similar to what happened to the United States when we exited Vietnam. Because we had been supporting the Mujahideen that were fighting against the, the Soviets in Afghanistan, though, the Mujahideen will eventually establish a republic, but it is based on Islamic um, an, an Islamic terrorist type of regime. And ultimately, the Mujahideen will allow for the rise of the Taliban in um, Afghanistan, which will ultimately come back to bite us in the butt, as we know, in the 1990s and early 2000s. We had no way of knowing this at the time, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, but that is what will eventually happen. So this is why we need to pay attention to what's going on in the world at any given time, because it can come back to bite us in the butt later. Gorbachev hoped to slow the arms race with the INF Treaty, because the USSR could no longer afford the guns versus butter debate. <laughs> uh, they could no longer afford uh, to maintain the nuclear arms race. So what Gorbachev was trying to do was salvage the Soviet economy and save it from save communism from falling apart. Ultimately, that is exactly the reverse of what happens. In 1986, Gorbachev's policy of glasnost, which means openness, encouraged citizens to discuss ways to improve society without fear of censorship. Glasnost also could be seen as more openness towards negotiations or diplomacy with the West, like you just saw on the previous slide, with Gorbachev discussing things with then U.S. President Ronald Reagan. Um, Alexei, Alexei Eva said about glasnost, glasnost is a word that had been in the Russian language for centuries. It was in the direct dictionaries and law books as long as there had been dictionaries and law books. It was an ordinary, hardworking, nondescript word that was used to refer to a process, any process of justice of governance being conducted in the open. Transparency, if you will. Here is a uh, political cartoon about Glasnost. If she's, li if she's like this as a baby, what should we be when she's grown up? Democratic freedom. There's another one. Get letting the skeletons out of the closet, if you will, open. In 1986, Gorbachev's economic program called perestroika or restructuring allowed elements of capitalism in some places, private property and free markets in some places, similar to what Lenin had done with his new economic policy. The Soviet era joke was, What's the difference between communism and capitalism? Under capitalism, people exploit other people and under communism, it's the other way around. <laughs> in 1989, Gorbachev unveiled the policy of democratization <laughs> or democratization, allowing free elections in the USSR. This will be the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. His intentions were good, but ultimately it led to the unraveling of the communist regime. Gorbachev encouraged Eastern Europeans that had been Soviet satellite states for years to reform their own political systems without fear of Soviet armed intervention, like you saw under Brezhnev with Prague Spring. He hoped they would remain communist allies, however, that they would not give up their own private communist governments, but they would not have to keep the Soviet presence there in order to maintain those friendships. But ultimately, what ended up happening is one by one, each would free itself from communist control and become a democracy. Not what Gorbachev had hoped would happen. In 1989, the Solidarity Movement, an anti-communist, anti-USSR labor union with millions of members, 
forced the Polish leaders to run free elections. Poland will be the first of the satellite states, the Soviet bloc satellite states, to become free. The communists lost control of the government in the election. The solidarity leader was Lech Walesa. He will become the president of a free Poland in 1989. November of 1989, following what had happened in Poland, the East German leaders opened up the Berlin Wall and Germany was reunited a year later. The Berlin Wall comes down and Germany is reunited as a free nation. Here are pictures of the wall coming down. Other Eastern European satellite states also abandoned communism. Hungary and Czechoslovakia both in late 1989, cutting down the barbed wire. It's over. In the Velvet Revolution, the people of Czechoslovakia peacefully overthrew communism, called the Velvet Revolution because it was nonviolent. And Balaklav Havel will become the new leader of Czechoslovakia. The Romanian dictator, who was very communist, named Nicolae Ceausescu, resisted the revolution in Romania. And he ultimately, he and his wife both, will be captured and executed by the people. And Romania will become a free nation. There he is dead. So the collapse of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe ultimately inspired republics within the Soviet Union to also seek independence. By 1991, the communist hardliners attempted to overthrow Gorbachev in the August coup, hoping to preserve communism, to keep the Soviet Union from unraveling. Um, Gennady Yanovlev said, let me say that Mikhail Gorbachev is now on vacation. He is undergoing treatment himself in our country. He is very tired after these many years and he will need some time to get better. He really wasn't, it was a coup. Ultimately, this coup was led by Boris Yeltsin who became president of a Russian Republic. And ultimately communism will not be saved, but instead the Russian people thwarted this coup and rejected communism. On December of 1991, Gorbachev officially resigned as the president of the USSR and Yeltsin will become the new president. But by then all the republics had declared their independence and the Soviet Union is no more. He had tried to reform the unreformable, a friend of Gorbachev said. By December 25th, 1991, the Soviet Union is done. The Cold War ended with the breakup of the Soviet Union, leaving the U.S. as the world's sole superpower. But within the next couple of decades, the United States will be challenged as a superpower by communist China, as we still know today. And a kind of resurgence of old Cold War politics has started happening with Putin in, in charge of um, Russia. So it remains to be seen what will happen next. Thank you.